Greetings, good people all over the world. This is Laszlo Montgomery bringing you another Chinese saying here at the podcast show that since 2016 has, even to this day, remained true to its name, the Chinese Sayings Podcast. And today's feature, Cheng Yu, for a change, doesn't come from the spring and autumn or warring states periods. Our selection for this time comes from a eh, mostly forgotten figure, a scholar official from the northern Song dynasty named Pang Yuanying. He wrote a collection of essays on diverse topics called Tan So, or Congregating to Hold Conversation. And the feature, Cheng Yu, that we're going to examine today goes like this. Shu Dao Hu Sun San. But before we jump to the story, here's a quick analysis of the five characters that make up this Cheng Yu. A Shu is a tree, and the character Dao in the third tone means to fall. Shu Dao, a tree falls. A Hu Sun is a monkey, or specifically a macaque. And the last character San means to scatter or disperse. Shu Dao Hu Sun San. Tree falls, monkeys scatter. Well, without knowing the story, you may be able to guess the meaning behind this one. But if you've never heard the story behind these five characters, you're left to guess. What's the backstory behind Shu Dao Hu Sun San? And the lead character of our story is one of the all time great villains from Chinese history and certainly from the times he lived in. And this was Qin Hui. Now, if there's one person from Chinese history who's been spit on more than Qin Hui, I don't know who that might be. More about that in a bit. Qin Hui was a high-ranking official at the court of the ill-fated Song emperors Hui Zong and Qin Zong. All of this was covered ad nauseum, the CHP four-part series covering the life of Emperor Hui Zong. That was CHP episodes 132 to 135. By the year 1126, the Jurchens, who had already established the Jin dynasty in northern China, began pushing closer to the northern Song capital of Bianjing, which is modern-day Kaifeng, Henan province. These Jurchens were a warlike tribal confederation with very strong leadership, and their homelands were in the cold northeast of China. We remember them today as the Manchus, but... Back in the 12th century, they were known as the Jurchens. They had been probing Song China from the north and figured out that the defenses were in no state to resist if they chose to mount a full-scale invasion. So the Jurchens, assured of their military superiority, were not afraid to become more aggressive and pushy with the demands they kept making with the Song royal court. One day, the Jurchen ruler dispatched an envoy to the Song imperial court, telling them if they only handed over these three towns, they'd no longer make any further incursions into Song territory. Well, facing this grave challenge, Qin Hui strongly insisted that the Song should not show any weakness in the face of this oncoming Jurchen invasion. He wrote multiple memorials to the emperor, essentially arguing that if the Song were to grant the Jurchens these three towns, the Jurchens would know at once the Song were in sad shape and the demands would never cease. But Qin Hui's requests were overruled and the three towns were indeed granted to the Jurchens. And just as Qin Hui had predicted in 1127, the Jurchens besieged and then captured the Song imperial capital itself. And in one of the most humiliating episodes in the history of imperial China, the Jurchens took as their prisoners the emperor Qin Zong, his father the former emperor Hui Zong, a considerable retinue of northern Song officials, including Qin Hui, and almost the entire royal family. And they were all sent on a forced march to one of the coldest, most inhospitable parts of Heilongjiang in Manchuria, to live out the rest of their lives. Emperor Hui Zong, he died in 1135, and his son, Emperor Qin Zong, he lasted until 1161. Qin Hui was also among the prisoners taken by the Jurchens, but he survived the ordeal, and surprisingly, even though he previously maintained a militant stance against the Jurchens, 
He knew who buttered his bread and ingratiated himself with his captors. They had gotten to know Qin Hui after he had been called upon by Hui Zong to write and present a letter of surrender to the Jurchens. And in this document, the emperor offered the Jurchens heavy bribes as well as a promise to act as their vassal state if the Jurchens would only let them return south to their homeland. Now, the Jurchens didn't accept this proposal, but they looked very kindly on its writer and messenger, Qin Hui. And from then on, Qin Hui found himself well-treated by the Jurchen royals. In his capacity as a former Song court official and advisor, he was often passed around the households of important Jurchens as a gift. And from the years 1127 to 1130, he even rode out on a series of battles with Jurchen leaders bent on conquering even more Song territory. He had clearly gone over to the other side. Well, in 1130, acting on some mysterious motive, Qin Hui escaped from the Jurchens and one day reappeared at the southern Song court. The Song dynasty, its previous territorial holdings considerably shrunken, was now ruled by another of Emperor Hui Zong's sons, Emperor Gao Zong, who had moved the Song capital south to Jinling, modern-day Nanjing, on the other side of the Yangtze River, just out of reach of the Jurchens. At the new Song capital and under a new emperor, Qin Hui gave them a whole song and dance about how he had killed his Jurchen guards and made this daring escape. And the new emperor, glad to regain an experienced official from his father's court, didn't ask too many questions, and Qin Hui was reincorporated into the Song dynasty ranks. Contrary to his old stance against the Jurchens, in 1141, Qin Hui was instrumental in brokering a peace treaty between the southern Song and the Jurchen Jin dynasty. And this was the Treaty of Shaoxing, where the southern Song effectively agreed to become a tribute nation to the Jurchens, and also agreed to give up claims to contested territory in the north of China. Although this treaty meant that the Jurchens left the southern Song mostly in peace for another decade, it came at a high cost. For one thing, there was the popular and talented Song general Yue Fei. Yue Fei was known for his extreme patriotism and his willingness to fight the Jurchens for every inch of Song territory. And he did not agree with the words contained in this Shaoxing Treaty. And so popular and influential was Yue Fei, his resistance to giving in to the Jurchen demands became widespread and shared by the people. Therefore, in order to remove Yue Fei from the equation, Qin Hui hatched a plot to have him executed before the emperor could intercede on his behalf. I detailed the tragic death of Yue Fei in CHP episode 95. This great hero in Chinese history was executed at the hands of the dynasty to whom he had been loyal all his life. And in the process, by dying tragically, he turned Qin Hui into a popular villain in the eyes of history. Perhaps Qin Hui truly had the Song dynasty's best interests at heart when he brokered the Treaty of Shaoxing, but in doing so, he pitted his reputation against one of China's best-loved popular figures. As folk tales about Yue Fei's courage, patriotism, and conviction spread in every successive dynasty, so did folk tales about Qin Hui's duplicity, smallness of mind, and weakness. One such popular tale is the tale of Cao Yong, one of Qin Hui's loyal followers when Qin returned to the southern court and began gaining power. As the story goes, Cao Yong earned a high position in the Song court by sucking up to and flattering Qin Hui. Because of his closeness to Qin Hui, Cao Yong grew rich and powerful, and all his friends and relatives began cozying up to him now that he had newfound wealth and power. But there was one relative who refused to do so, and that was his wife's brother, Li Desi. Li Desi not only refused to be friendly with Cao Yong, but He actually criticized him to his face and also behind his back, saying, This husband of my sister has no real talent. He only got to where he is by virtue of sucking up to Qin Hui. 
Well, the relationship between the two men was understandably strained, and they spent much of their life sparring politically, trying to take each other down. When Xin Hui was alive and in favor, Cao Yong was untouchable. However, after Qin Hui died in 1155, the Emperor Gaozong demoted many of Qin Hui's former cronies. Cao Yong was no exception. As the now disgraced and demoted Cao and his family traveled with their tail between their legs to take up a new post in one of the provinces, a fast messenger arrived with a letter from Li De Si, and this is where we get the Cheng Yu. When Cao Yong opened the letter, it contained a mocking poem Li De Si had written. And the poem contained the following couplet from which we get this Chinese saying, Hua Kai Die Man Zhi, Shu Dao Hu Sun San. When the blossoms bloom, butterflies fill the branches. When the great tree falls, the monkeys scatter. The poem made Cao Yong so comically angry that he tore it to pieces while gnashing his teeth, but of course he was now in no position to do anything in retaliation. This poem was pretty clear in its meaning. When someone's in power or riding high due to circumstances, they'll have no shortage of followers. Everybody's trying to be their baby. But as soon as they fall from power or their luck runs out, their followers unfollow them and scatter. And the last part of this phrase he used derogatorily to describe people who leave opportunistically when their leader falls. This is sort of like that Cheng Yu from season four, Man Ke Luo Chue. That one featured Han Dynasty figure Lord Jai, one so popular his courtyard was filled with hangers-on. But as soon as he fell from power, you could catch sparrows in a net in his courtyard. So few were the guests calling on him. I'm sure all cultures have something similar to this tale. Nobody loves you when you're down and out, just like John sang on the Walls and Bridges album. So that's the story behind Shu Dao Hu Sun San. When the tree falls, the monkeys scatter. That's sort of a distant cousin to rats deserting the sinking ship. And you get extra credit if you say the five characters that precede our Chinese saying for this episode. Hua Kai Die Man Zhi. When the blossoms bloom, butterflies fill the branches. But in real life, when you use this Cheng Yu, all you need to say is Shu Dao Hu Sun San a regular occurrence in politics. And as far as Qin Hui getting spit on, if you go to the Yuefei Temple in Hangzhou, they have iron statues inside the courtyard of Qin Hui and his wife, who was just like him. Although you can't do this anymore, over the years, people would go there and spit on these iron statues. And there's now signs there saying, don't spit on the statues. So... Yeah, if you ever go to Hangzhou, visit the Yuefei Temple, and uh, don't spit on Qin Hui and his wife, but take in the whole scene and remember this Cheng Yu, Shu Dao Hu Sun San. Remember, at the website, you can always find a listing of all the terms used in this episode. Many of you have told me how helpful that is, so that's why I do it. Okay, that's going to be it for this time. I thank you all kindly for stopping by and listening. We're now halfway through Season 8. Time sure does fly when you're having fun. And speaking of fun, another sincere shout-out goes out to Dependable Emma out in Beijing in the PRC, marshalling the forces out at the Chengyu Yanqiu Zhongxin. Thanks once again, Emma. All right, as always, this is your host and humble narrator, Laszlo Montgomery, signing off from Santa Monica, California this time. But you probably couldn't tell. Please please me, oh yeah, and consider the possibility of joining me next time for another useful episode of the Chinese Sayings Podcast.